you know, um, schools in states like Massachusetts, right? Looking, you know, in my home state here and saying, oh, it's too progressive. It's too liberal. You know, I don't want my kid going to a school where they can't have an open debate or they're being, quote unquote, indoctrinated. You know, higher ed is an easy target. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above, the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, and I've been a middle and high school principal and a high school social studies teacher. And as always, I'm joined by... What up, family? My name is Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. I'm a high school history teacher here in the Los Angeles area. This is year 21 in the classroom for me. And this here, of course, is all of the above. Your home for news and analysis of all matters pertaining to our, dare I say, wonderful world of education. Now, Jeff, do do my eyes deceive me? Are we on video right now? <laughs> is this a video episode? We are indeed, man. Well, it feels like it's been forever. We, uh, <laughs> we've we been, you know, recording just about every week during the passing periods, but uh, we had to dust off the studio equipment. Man. We got a, a, another super dope guest today to uh, to engage with, man. Well, we are officially back out here on these YouTube streets. We are, man. We are. And shout out to anybody who does watch us on YouTube. Most folks who are a part of our All of the Above family, listen on the go, listen to the audio. And of course, we drop content. We try to we try to keep it coming every week with a passing period or something. But if you only follow us on YouTube, you've probably been missing those. And you haven't seen us since like May or something like that. Uh, great to see you again. Uh, thumbs up, subscribe, all that good stuff. But also check us out. Check us out. Uh, you know, follow us on your favorite podcast streaming app because we, of course, do drop passing period episodes in between these full video episodes. And Jeff, I got to say, you look great, man. You look great. Ain't seen you on this video format since <laughs> since May. You're, you're looking great, man. Looking great. And well, for anybody thank you, man. who well. does listen on the go, definitely uh, you know click that link underneath the episode, which will take you to our YouTube channel, and go ahead and hit that thumbs up, anyways, whether you listen to the episode or not. That helps us out, helps us out big time, big time. So Jeff, man, here we are, October, on video, super dope guest in the building, all that good stuff, man. What are we talking about today, man? What's on the agenda for today's all of the above full episode? Well, man, well, today we got a good one for everybody as per usual, and uh, we fully intend to keep our streak of having only the dopest guests uh, intact here on All the Above, seven years running, and uh, we, we have a fascinating guest. Today we're bringing on Kirk Carapeza, who is a reporter and podcaster for GBH News um, out of Boston. Um, he is also, most importantly for today, the co-host of the podcast College Uncovered, which is a fascinating show about all kinds kinds of interesting, uh, juicy, equity-centered issues um, in our higher education system. Um, and of course, here in All the Above, we talk quite deeply about our K-12 system on a regular basis, but we kind of just dip our toe into those higher ed waters, um, us being you know K-12 focused folks. So really excited to bring on today a higher education expert, a fellow podcaster, someone who can uh, really shed some light on some of the, the very headline gripping, um, fascinating kinds of issues that have been uh, popping up across college campuses in particular over the last year or so. Uh, so that's what we're going to dig into to, uh, today, folks. It's going to be fascinating. You definitely don't want to miss it. Yeah, some higher education dopeness in the building. Uh, looking forward to that conversation and also want to extend a warm welcome to anybody who might be tuning in for the very first time, maybe because of who we have on or maybe because we just popped up in your YouTube algorithm because YouTube's like, oh, we remember these guys. Let's 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 float them into some educators feeds or something. Uh, so shout out to everybody who might be joining us for the first time. It's just a two person operation. You know what I'm saying? Just, like just public school teacher and public school administrator, super duper dope principal leader man with us. And, um, you know, congrats uh, very much thankful for everybody who has contributed to all of the above. So check out our website, aotashow.com for all the previous episodes and ways to support because we don't, you know, we don't really do commercials and sponsorships and all that stuff. We are just some public school educators trying to talk about some important issues within our public school system. All right. So we very much appreciate everybody's support. Now on to the first segment, which is um, our do now. Always got to start a good lesson plan with a Gripping do now. So let's go ahead and uh, check out the latest in the world of education. 
coming up next. Stay tuned. All right, folks, now it's time for today's Do Now. Let's take a look at some of the latest headlines and stories in the world of education. Jeff, how are we going to do the Do Now today? Well, man, well, today we're going to drop in uh, some important, salient, resonant, uh, centrally important, <laughs> controlling <laughs> ideas. I'm, 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 I'm trying here, folks. Uh, we got lexicon, man. Well, we're going to dig into some key vocabulary today. Okay, some key terms, some key vocab. Good way to start it off. Start off the lesson, frame it right. Um, all right, Jeff, what's the first term for today's lexicon? First up today, Manuel, is the term puff. Puff. All right, now, Jeff, I know it's been a minute since we've been out here <laughs> on these YouTube streets, and I know the algorithms like that clickbaity stuff, that hot stuff, and mm, I, I hope we don't mm. have a story here about Puffy, because, like, you know, I get it. That's a big story, <laughs> but that's not quite what we're about here at all of the above. So we ain't talking about that puff, right? We most certainly are not. Uh, there will be zero Diddy conversation today, other than to, you know, like, stipulate that uh, allegedly your boy's a monster. But, uh, <laughs> you know, no, different different kind of puff here, Manuel. Well, okay. Today we're, we're, we're talking about puff as in puff piece, as uh. in when a person of, uh, you know, great notoriety uh, writes a piece about uh, you know, a system, a person, an institution that uh, perhaps tends in the direction of promotional material rather uh, than, you know, reasoned, thoughtful reporting and analysis. Uh, we, we have a puff piece to talk about today, Manuel. Okay, I'm not sure the algorithm likes that as much as, you know, talking about PDD. But uh, let's go ahead, man. What we got? What we got? Yeah, we we got to try and compete out here some somehow. <laughs> yeah, this this is an interesting one, Manuel. Um, today's story uh, comes to us from Linda Darling Hammond uh, in EdSource, okay. and uh, folks may know Linda Darling Hammond, noted education scholar, is also president of the California State Board of Ed. She published a piece in EdSource um, on October tenth. And it noted that the release of California's test data shows that our public schools are continuing to turn the corner on pandemic recovery with gains on most assessments while highlighting areas where we have more work to do. Overall, the percentages of California students meeting or exceeding the proficiency standards for English language arts and math and science increased uh, about one and a half points each. This is encouraging, she notes, given that the population of socioeconomically disadvantaged students tested increased yet again year over year, as it has for each of the last three years. This time, it was up two points from 63 to 65%, um, which in real numbers is an increase of more than 60,000 students. Furthermore, Black and Latino students showed positive score trends in math across all grades, and the stubborn achievement gap long experienced by Black students began to close with gains larger than the statewide averages in math and ELA at several grade levels grade levels. The same was true for the state's foster youth. Now, Darling Hammond touts California's smarter balanced assessments as being particularly rigorous for assessing a broader range of content in ELA, as well as more complex content than is tested in many states, with item types that extend beyond multiple choice and even ask students to engage in things like research. A recent study from Washington State University provided evidence for this belief. The study found that over half of students who scored a level two or nearly meets on the Smarter Balanced um, high school math test and more than one third of those who scored a level one still successfully enrolled in post-secondary learning without additional remedial courses and the large majority succeeded. So uh, Manuel, you read this piece. I read this piece. Our vocabulary term today is puff <laughs> for puff piece. I uh, would be very curious to hear your take on, uh, you know, the great Linda Darling Hammonds, Linda Darling Hammonds assessment of California State's um, standardized test scores. So you're right. I, I think puff piece is a good way to describe this. Good way to describe this for sure. Um, but, you know, we are, I guess, 1.5% one, 1 closer to liberation, Jeff, 
to uh, freedom and justice for all <laughs> as we get those test scores up. 1% at a time, Jeff. We're getting there. We are getting there. So, you know, you know me, I'm a, 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 a little bit of a skeptic when it comes to standardized testing. And although she's right, the smarter balanced assessment that students take in California, it, you know, it's not your, you know, it's not the, 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 the assessments of, of back in the day when we were first entering the classroom, Jeff. It's not just simple multiple choice stuff. There is some really, um, you know, really complex stuff that is asked students to do. So, of course, seeing any gains, you know, that's not that's not bad news. You know, it's, it's good to see some gains. But the gain that stood out to me is that the proportion of students taking the test who are socioeconomically disadvantaged has increased. I think that's really the big question. Why are more and more students disadvantaged. I think that speaks to the larger challenges that we have in California, the larger economic challenges, large, larger social challenges. And although, you know, we could talk about the test and whether or not, or to the extent to which it might be valid and might be helpful, it might be important. I think we need to be talking more about what is the state of things for the middle class and the lower middle class and, and, and all folks across California as the housing crisis continues to, to impact our families, as folks' insurance policies are being dropped because of climate change, and as just the general calamity of the world continues to just be calamitous. And I don't know, I probably just made up that word. So, uh, you know, that's a percentage that stood out to me, Jeff, is just the fact that we're just kind of just assuming that, like, this is just the way it's going to be. There's going to be more and more struggling young people in our school system and um, that's a problem and of course it's not a problem for the schools necessarily to solve but to me that is like the big thing that we need to be talking about we clearly aren't doing enough as a society to support um, those students who are experiencing homelessness or who are uh, living in poverty and, and all these different challenges that that of course impact their engagement in the school system for sure and I, yeah. it also stands out to me that whole like closing the achievement gap part and like narrowing it, I guess not closing it, but narrowing it or whatever. Uh, you know, this piece didn't touch on it, but I do suspect, I do suspect that the rush back to testing, the rush back to seeing standardized testing as like a super important thing because of learning loss, learning loss, Jeff, just think of the learning loss. I do think that that rush back to it is more pronounced in those schools that have been historically disadvantaged, historically marginalized. And mm -hmm. those students might be getting a lot more of that I ready, a lot more of teaching to the test, teaching to the test every day than students in more affluent areas where they perhaps get more opportunities to just engage in some learning and some enrichment and some dopeness. So I don't know how much to celebrate the fact that uh, the scores went up even more in those more uh, challenged and historically disadvantaged populations because maybe that's just because they're being fed more direct curriculum tied to the test. So that worries me as well. So, um, yeah. you know, pup piece, man. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, well, okay. I have a, a few thoughts. My first thought, I got to give you know credit where credit is due. I think that the use of standardized test scores that she is describing in this article, which is it begins at least with an assessment of the state's overall performance with educating its students, and most importantly, with an equity lens, looking at you know are we growing overall in terms of our you know purpose and target of having more students demonstrate mastery of the standards and are we closing opportunity and achievement gaps for our most marginalized youth and, and in california that definitely includes our black students it includes our um our homeless and foster youth it includes students with ieps includes english learners etc so i appreciate the fact that like actually this in my mind is the right use of standardized test score data which is to assess the quality of our system overall and to uh to also shed some light on that now i think you know speaking of puff piece she's probably <laughs> a little generous in attributing these gains to you know some of gavin newsom's uh public policies which of course you know the state legislature passed as well but you know to create more community schools to invest in uh, supplemental services like after school tutoring and enrichment things of that nature and these of course are good things it's noted to me that what's missing in her assessment of that is the like quality education and efforts of the teachers who are working every day with these students, um, particularly when now two out of three students in the state of California are um, qualifying as socioeconomically disadvantaged, which is stunning unto itself. Two thirds of the students yeah. in our state's public schools are poor. And yeah. our bar for what poor means 
is incredibly low. And in a super high priced state like California, that means like the vast majority, I'm, I'm speculating here, but we're talking about 80 plus percent, are kids who are actually living in some version of what you would, what anyone would consider poverty in this country uh, from a standpoint of comparing their you know, family income with the actual cost of living in this ridiculously expensive state. So, um, so I wanna give her some credit uh, up front that like, hey, she's actually using standardized test scores the way they should be used, which is not to blame individual teachers, but to assess the quality of our system overall and then think strategically about what we can do societally and institutionally within the field of education to improve those results. So I appreciate that. Now, onto the puff piece part, she spends like half the article talking about how cool Smarter Balanced is. Now, I'm not necessarily here to dispute any of the individual points she's making about the rigor of Smarter Balanced assessments versus other states that say, you know, only have multiple choice reading comprehension questions on their ELA exam versus California that has, you know, more rigorous questions and, and, and a number of other states that use the Smarter Balanced assessment as well. But um, let's keep it a buck here, Manuel. Um, there's nothing particularly special <laughs> about Smarter Balance. Like it is a, you know, it's a standardized test that makes use of new technologies that are available in this historical era that allows to have computer adaptive testing. And, you know, we don't have to rely on paper scantrons and things of that nature. Um, so yes, it's fancier in that sense, but like it's, it's, on another level, it is simply just a regular old standardized test. And um, it also is a super expensive test. It's a test that dominates the curriculum uh, in this state in very unfortunate ways. It's a test that narrows the curriculum uh, in very unfortunate ways. And it is also extremely expensive um, to administer. Now, I don't expect that Linda Darling Hammond is gonna be the mouthpiece for these talking points, but I did expect a little bit more from her in terms of not just, you know, sort of writing this piece that's like, look how cool Smarter Balanced is. I mean, there's all kinds of critiques you can make um, of Smarter Balanced, even though it is an important, you know, especially at the large scale across a huge state like California, it's an important instrument of measurement of assessing equity and impact. Um, and that is important, but we didn't need half an article about how cool this assessment is and how proud we should be of it. I, I beg to differ, uh, to be honest. Um, I think it's important we have standardized assessment to be able to make comparisons across large populations, but we spend tons of time, money, effort, energy, on the testing apparatus in this state that flows from Smarter Balance that absolutely um, from my perspective, could be better spent in other ways. We could shorten these tests. We could narrow these tests. They don't need to be as long as they are. They don't need to uh, be as stressful as they are on the system of education as a whole, let alone on the you know students and educators who um, get this data weaponized against them in ways that's actually improper, um, both statistically and you know politically to do. And so you know, from my perspective, Manuel, it felt like she missed the mark. Maybe I'm not surprised, but uh, I feel like, you know, it's, it's our duty, it's others' duty to, to say like, hey, thanks for using the data responsibly in the start of your piece. And the second half of that piece was basically unnecessary propaganda to, you know, to prop up this, this element of the kind of testing industrial complex. Mm. I see what you're saying, Jeff. I see what you're saying. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I've always understood you to be a lover of standardized testing in all of its forms. And I've always taken you to be somebody who believes that standardized testing is specifically the way towards liberation. So <laughs> interesting, Jeff. Interesting. Listen, man. Listen, standardized testing has a place. It's an important instrument of measurement. It's not something that the State Board of Ed needs to put out a propaganda piece to support, uh, you know, once a year uh, to tell us that, you know, 1.5 points of growth is, is liberation. Like, you know, it, this is yeah. important news to talk about. Let's get down to the conversation about how we are institutionally supporting and enabling the success of our schools. How are we training, retaining, investing in educators? How are we making the social and life conditions of students and families around schools better such that they can come to school actually able to engage and prepare instead of struggling with the basic elements of survival in a deeply economically and racially unjust country. Let's talk about those things, okay? And our standardized test scores actually can give us some data <laughs> to help us 
justify that conversation. So I'm here for it in that sense, but we don't need a puff piece about how cool Smarter Balanced is. Like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Well, there goes our Smarter Balanced sponsorship, Jeff. We're finally about to get our first sponsor <laughs> here on All of the Above, and uh, there goes that. Um, in any case, Jeff, we do have other vocab to get to because, of course, you know, vocabulary is very important to uh, raise these test scores, maybe get them up to like 1.6% increase or whatever. So one more lexicon term for today's do now, Jeff, and that is the term abolish. Mm, yes, one of my favorite words, Manuel. Uh, I'm, th I'm thinking about uh, abolition of slavery. I'm talking about the abolitionist movement in a modern context that people want to get rid of prisons. Uh, I'm, I, you know, this is like one of those revolutionary terms that speaks to the to my soul, Manuel, right here. I love it. Abolish. Let's uh, let's abolish some unjust things in this world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a known uh, Marxist, cultural Marxist at that, uh, socialist uh, <laughs> California crazy that you are, of course you would be in support of, of this story here because crazy California, you know, they wanted to abolish the police, Jeff, and they wanted to abolish mm. ICE. They just want to abolish every American institution, including now, according to the story, the right to be given uh, advantage in college admissions because your parents donated or went to that school. Now, Jeff, that is an American mm. tradition that has stood for a very long time, these legacy admissions, and California has now abolished them. So let's get into it. This story comes to us by way of Mikhail Zeinstein for Cal Matters. And he reports that California recently passed a new law that prohibits private nonprofit colleges from granting students an admissions advantage if their parents donated to or went to that school. California now joins Illinois, uh, Maryland, Colorado, Virginia as the only current states that ban this practice known as legacy admissions. California colleges in California will still be allowed to admit students with alumni or donor ties, but they'll no longer be able to grant preferential treatment to those applicants in the admissions process. California Governor Gavin Newsom wrote in a press statement, quote, if Cal in California, everyone should be able to get ahead through merit, skill, and hard work. The California dream shouldn't be accessible to just a lucky few, which is why we're opening the door to higher education wide enough for everyone fairly. Now backers say that this legislation is necessary is a necessary corrective to last year's US Supreme Court ruling that banned colleges from using race as a factor in admissions. If the Supreme Court decision sowed any doubt for students that they're wanted on college campuses, well, supporters say this new law aims to reverse that feeling at least here in California. Now, only seven private nonprofit universities out of about 90 in California admitted students whose family members either donated money to the school or attended the school themselves, at least as of fall 2022. Now, this amounted to slightly more than 3,300 undergraduates. Now, USC's admits with donor or alumni ties that year, 2022, amounted to 14.4% of its total admits that year, and Stanford's legacy admits accounted for 13.8% of its total admits for that year. And Jeff, of course, notably our favorite university in California, the number one public university around the world, UCLA, um, the percentage of their admits who got in thanks to legacy admissions um, was 0%, of course, because it's not allowed at um, public university anyways, but, you know, just wanted to point that out. So, Jeff, they're abolishing everything in California, crazy California, abolishing all these American institutions. What are your thoughts? Yeah, my thoughts are, this is great, uh, absolutely, and I can hear, I can almost hear the, the whining. I can, I can hear the drone of, of rich people, entitled, spoiled, billionaire children, and their their predatory parents who are feeling oppressed because they actually have to, to actually compete with other people in order to get into a school that they firmly believe is theirs because their granddaddy's name is on the library or whatever it might be. Uh, and honestly, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of joy in, <laughs> in the whining and tears. Rich tears uh, bring me joy, Manuel. Uh, at least, you know, these kind of tears. I, I believe in the humanity of all people. But, um, I, so this is great policy from that perspective. And I feel like buried in this story is also a really important detail I want to call out uh, that 
helps explain why this is so important. So the data point that you cited about in, uh, 2000, in 2022, there were uh, about 3,300 students in these um, the remaining private institutions that practiced uh, legacy admissions in California. But that was out of a class of about 30,000 students. So we're talking about almost 10% of the students who were admitted to this school on an annual basis, and, I, and let's be real, we can assume that that number was probably greater, at least at some periods in the past than it is today, knowing the writing was on the wall uh, politically about some of these policies. But we're talking about one in 10 students when you're walking around campus are there with preferential treatment because of their parents, your grandparents or family wealth. Um, and its contributions to the university. So the you know the idea that the the sort of landscape of the meritocracy in this country has been tilted by affirmative action, and now we're getting rid of affirmative action, and we're just you know now the purity of the meritocracy is taking over. Now nah, now the <laughs> now the like naked corruption of <laughs> of the unmeritocracy uh, you know that's always been there will just simply continue to dominates unto itself. And there are, you know, we've reported on previous episodes of the show that at some, uh, you know, elite institutions around the country, there was as high as 30% or more of an incoming class that would be legacy admissions. So I think people have to keep in mind the pervasiveness of the legacy admissions process here. And, um, and so that I think is a very important point we need to call out. Then Manuel, I have to say, as much as I find this to be an important piece of equity policy, I also find myself being a little bit worried because I know how things go in this country. I know how, in particular, how wealthy people operate and they don't accept, uh, you know, fair or equal treatment by institutions. They find ways to corrupt those institutions to serve their interests. This is the, you know, pattern they've been up to since, you know, 16, 19 or whatever. So, uh, so in that sense, man, well, I find myself a little bit worried about what's going to happen now. So are the, is this just going to go sort of underground <laughs> in some way? <laughs> is it, are they going to start having like special home schools or something for their kids where they just get straight A's and then they get to qualify to go to, you know, to go to UCLA or like, like what are they going to do here? to maintain their base of power and their interests. Cause you know, they're not just gonna be like, well, I guess, you know, the rules change and now we have to play by the rules. Like these are the most corrupt, cheatingest, crooked, gangstery, violent people in the world, right? <laughs> like, yeah. like, and you know, it's not to paint with too broad of a brush here, but these are the, these are the real predatory uh, interests in, in our society. Uh, and we have to expect that they are going to not go down without a fight. So I'm, I'm curious to see where this is going in as much as I think it's great policy. How dare you besmirch the good names of rich, powerful, elite folks? Wow, Jeff. Wow. Um, so yeah, I'm in agreement. This is great policy. You know, I, I, I'm happy to see California do it. I'm happy to see it join those other states who are also doing this. I think it's a necessary, uh, you know, step to take after the Supreme Court ruling. I mean, folks somehow only, only, only here, only in America could folks somehow contort their minds to believe that, that being a person of color is somehow an advantage in any of these, uh, historically racist institutions. Um, but they did. And of course, there went the Supreme Court ruling uh, banning uh, race conscious admissions. So yeah, the added legacy admissions then because if, if somehow some way being a person of color is some kind of advantage in these institutions, well, we know for a fact, being the child of donors or the child of folks who uh, previously went to that university, we know that's an advantage. So might as well scrap that, too. And in fact, I mean, it just seems obvious that that should be nationwide policy in light of the Supreme, of the Supreme Court decision. You know, folks always get mad when it, it, it seems like people of color, particularly black people, are benefiting from any kind of system. It, folks always get mad when it seems like there's any sort of benefit being had by black folks on any kind of practice or policy or within any institution across the U.S. But folks always just kind of ignore all the other advantages. So legacy admissions has been ignored by the lion's share of folks paying any attention to college and, and higher education uh, for so long, for so long. And of course, we're still, you know, just 
accepting that it's okay for a school to give preferential treatment to, to athletes. And I'm not against that because, you know, athletes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely down for anything that, that athletes can gain from the system that makes so much money off their backs. But like, there's a lot of just assumptions that it's just okay to give preference to, to legacies, give preference to athletes, give preference to whoever. But when it comes to how dare you give any preference to, to a black student who is highly qualified for that university and has done everything to meet the requirements and might add to the university's uh, level of diversity? How dare you give that person any kind of advantage? So, so of course, I'm glad to see that legacy admissions now is is outlawed in California. Now, the bill did, um, it was modified along the way. So there was going to be a, a pretty stiff penalty on any school that continues the practice of legacy admissions. My understanding that is that the final version of the of of the legislation doesn't have that stiff penalty anymore, but there is uh, transparency. So a school that is found to violate this policy, um, it will be made uh, transparent how it how it violated this policy. Of course, nothing that discloses the particular student's identity uh, that might have gone in off the uh, basis of being the child of some big donor or whatever. Uh, but that will be publicly available data that opens them up to various uh, lawsuits, of course, from folks uh, across the state. So hopefully the USC's and Stanford's of the world go ahead and uh, dish that outdated practice. And there's a bunch of other um, private colleges that well, not a bunch. There's only seven total or whatever, but there's quite a few in there that um, I'm not very familiar with. So I was like, oh, I did really, I've never heard of this university. And they admitted 10 folks and it doesn't look like all 10 qualified for their basic uh, standard of admission. So, you know, I'm glad to see this practice go. And I do think those rich, powerful elites will continue to find ways. And I think even with legacy admissions, they were still finding all these different ways to get their kids in. And of course, that's what that big scandal at USC revealed when those uh, celebrity types had their kids getting in as like, what, it was a water polo and like soccer players and this and that, folks who had never actually stepped <laughs> on any field. So, and I, I it was primarily yes. USC. So, you know, yeah, my, my, my UCLA bias is showing there, but I think that also applied to UCLA in some kind of roundabout way. But in any case, yeah, Jeff, we already know, they go keep playing their games and getting their advantages for their kids, but... How dare any advantage go to any person of color? That, of course, is unacceptable in these United States of America. Indeed. Indeed. All right, folks. That about does it for today's Do Now. Up next, we have a super dope guest to discuss higher education and particular hot button issues within the higher education space uh, over the last several years. All right, so that's coming up next in our seminar. Stay tuned. Hey folks, thanks so much for tuning in to All The Above. We really appreciate you. And as you know, All The Above is a small operation. It's just me and just Manuel, that's it. We have no sponsorships, which means we are totally dependent on our amazing audience to help support the show. So here's what you can do. Go to our website, which is aotashow.com slash support. That's aotashow.com slash support. There you can find links to everything you can do to support the show. You find all the links to every platform that we're on where you can like, subscribe, follow, make sure you share our show with your whole network. Also, you can donate there. We are on Venmo, we're on Cash App, and most importantly, you can find the link to our Anchor page where you can become a monthly patron. Even a small donation once a month will make a huge difference in helping us continue to produce the show. Lastly, you can find there the link to get your flyest, best, latest, all the above show merch, okay? All you gotta do is go to aotashow.com slash support. Thanks, enjoy the rest of the show. All right, folks, welcome to today's seminar. Thanks so much for joining us. And we are incredibly excited to have with us today another fantastic guest, this time a, a fellow podcaster, although he's much more than, than just a podcaster, but uh, someone else who's in the education podcasting space. Uh, Kirk Garapeza is here all the way from Boston. Kirk, welcome to All the Above. Hey, great to be here, guys. Absolutely. Well, folks, let me tell you a little bit more about our guest. Kirk Carapeza is the managing editor and correspondent for Higher Ed at GBH News in Boston. He's also co-host of the podcast College Uncovered with John Marcus from the Heckinger Report. 
In his reporting, Kirk takes the time to capture the distinct voices of students and faculty, administrators, and thought leaders. He's been a writer and producer at WBUR in Boston, as well as a teacher and coach at Nativity Preparatory School in New Bedford, Mass. Kirk received his BA from the College of the Holy Cross and earned his MS from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Kirk, welcome again to All the Above, and I'm going to kick it over to Manuel for our first question. Yeah, we got some higher education dopeness in the building today. Kirk, thank you so much for taking time out to be here with us on All of the Above. Now, I happen to teach high schoolers, high school seniors, and I'm at an early college school where we have a lot of dual enrollment programming. Mm -hmm. So your podcast, College Uncovered, has been a great resource. I'm glad I, I landed on it uh, recently because I've been able to, to refer it to a lot of folks uh, within my, my circle because, um, you know, as, as has been mentioned, you touch on a lot of things going on in higher education. And one of those things that's going on in higher education is this discussion about political polarization and how it manifests and, of course, freedom of speech on campuses. And in your episode, Unwelcome to College, uh, you and your co-hosts explore how a small but growing number of students and families are feeling unwelcome on college campuses because of this political polarization. And... You profiled a lot of different students across the political spectrum. We heard from a lot of progressive voices and some conservative voices, and we did notice a, a, a bit of a pattern emerge. In, in the case of the uh, queer students and black students and, and female students, a lot of them were referencing specific legislation, specific policies enacted in their states or at their universities, uh, such as banning of books. One one of the speakers uh, mentioned leaving Florida because of DeSantis's Don't Say Gay Bill and how he felt um, more welcome going to a school in New York. But then on the conservative uh, side of things, those voices tended to point out the, uh, some idea of wokeness or college just being too liberal. And oftentimes this conversation is framed as just a general aversion to debate and a general um, climate where you can't say anything without offending anybody. Mm -hmm. And we're wondering if that's what your reporting revealed or, or how would you frame this, um, this discussion about political polarization on campuses considering uh, whatever patterns or whatever you notice in the differences in what some of the more progressive students were, were pointing to and what some of the more conservative students were pointing to. Yeah, I think when it comes to, you know, that episode you referred to, Unwelcome to College, we were looking at um, this trend where we're seeing, you know, when when we were choosing colleges, we might have been looking at, you know, the the academic prestige of the school or, you know, the, the you know, sports teams or the, the overall environment. Increasingly, no matter where you stand on the political spectrum, we're finding one in four students now, moderates, liberals, conservatives, are ruling out certain colleges based on the politics in the surrounding state, right? So that means you have, you know, LGBTQT students fleeing Florida, right? Because of, you know, certain restrictions on what can and cannot be taught in the classroom. You have um, black students increasingly choosing uh, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. Um, and you have conservative students ruling out, you know, um, schools in states like Massachusetts, right? Looking, you know, in my home state here and saying, oh, it's too progressive. It's too liberal. You know, I don't want my kid going to a school where they can't have an open debate or they're being, quote unquote, indoctrinated. You know, higher ed is an easy target, right? I think it really is. And I think that's one of the key takeaways from, from that episode. Um, and in many ways, higher ed has kind of lost the narrative. I think when you look at polling, you know, of... Uh, Americans and their trust in these institutions, once you get past the cost, um, uh, one of the top issues is, you know, people think that they're they're pushing political agendas, that professors are pushing political agendas. But again, I think it really depends on where you stand. Um, and in that, you know, in that and other episodes, we look at the, the recent protest over the war in Gaza. And I think, um, you know, when, when those encampments went up and the protests began, um, I happened to be in in rural uh, Missouri. I was in at, at a, a on campus at Northwest Missouri, and I think like I might as well have been on another planet at the time, right? This campus was where Missouri, Nebraska, Kansas, and Iowa meet, um, and these students were really just primarily focused on work, getting their degrees. Um, no one was really talking about the war in the Middle East. Um, there was really no, you know, um, debate over free speech or campus protests. But on certain college campuses, yes, I think, you know, the free speech and political environment has become so tense. 
at these primarily highly selective, you know, public and private colleges, places like Harvard and MIT or Emerson and Tufts here in the Northeast, UCLA out near near where you are. Um, but I think it's important to remember that these are the minority of schools. Um, and there was a survey that we cite in the podcast by a sociologist at Colby College. And he basically found that few college students joined Gaza related protests last spring. And you wouldn't know that, you know, if you watched cable news all the time and you read the New York Times, you would think that every single campus is inflamed with protests and there's this debate and it's, you know, just like the, the Vietnam War era. And that's a misperception, I think, that we try to dispel on the podcast that we're, we're talking about, you know, thousands of students protesting in this case, not millions like it was during Vietnam, where more than half of the college population was involved. Um, but we should say that, you know, at these schools where there are large protests, like Columbia, UCLA, where it actually turned violent, about a third of students there say the political climate has affected their education. And I think one of the key takeaways from this this podcast is that we're seeing this generation of college students now pick schools where they feel like they, they belong, no matter, again, where you stand on the political spectrum. Um, and once they're on campus, I don't know if you're finding this at the K-12 level, but in higher ed, I'm hearing from more and more professors who say that their students are adopting this kind of philosophy of safer, of silence is safer, that they'd rather, students would just rather not engage in debate because they're afraid of being publicly shamed on social media or on campus. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Kirk, we de we definitely want to dig uh, a little more into the, you know, the issues around the encampments and the protests and the, you know, activism uh, related to the Palestine and Israel issue. Before we jump into that, though, I did just want to follow up on what you said and, and really try to get your take on, like, what's the cost in your mind or maybe from, you know, from what you heard from scholars or other folks, what's the cost of the shift in that culture of, you know, silence is safer? Yeah, I think it's it's um, you know, it, it's easy to just kind of write it off and just like, oh, these are just college students. You know, this doesn't matter. But what what happens on college campuses is emblematic of broader society. Right. I think we're all in this environment now where um, Americans in many ways are being encouraged by their leaders to be afraid of each other and to not engage and to not talk to the other side and not have these uh, freewheeling discussions. Um, and the reality is that, you know, at these selective schools that we're talking about, you know, Columbia, UCLA, Harvard, MIT, these students are going to be our future leaders. So the cost, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, the leaders I've talked to, the higher ed leaders I've talked to see it as a threat to democracy, right? Where you have, um, you know, this research out of Georgetown, the, the Center on Education and the Workforce, Tony Carnevale, a, economist there um, did research and he basically finds that students who receive an American education, a, a liberal education, are much more likely to resist authoritarian tendencies because they're confident in their viewpoints, even if the viewpoint's challenged, right? But if you're not being challenged or you're not in these environments where you're, um, you know, meeting people who you disagree with or who don't look like you or don't have the same background, there's a lot at stake. In that case, if we're self segregating, you know, you know, the, the black students are going to HBCU or, um, you know, the conservative students are just going to the South. There's a lot at stake, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very much appreciate your uh, your perspective on that. And um, especially coming out of the, the K-12 system, where I would say perhaps more, at least anecdotally, more than silence is safer. I think we, we experience a lot of just silence. Uh, on on some of these issues and uh you know book bans and you know some of these sorts of things that are that are just simply not exposing students to the landscape of those conversations uh, which I can imagine over time is is only gonna you know potentially worsen um, that issue but uh, there you know there are good people out there uh, <laughs> keeping the flame around these kinds mm -hmm. of discussions and this kind of discourse um, in our in our k-12 system as well which is which is great to see Um but Kirk, tur turning back to the Israel and Palestine issue, obviously the you know the nation was um, rocked in many ways by the um, the student uprisings that took place over you know over the last year, and in your episode, uh, the politics of protest. And folks, by the way, we'll have the link. 
um, to College Uncovered below uh, in the notes for this episode. You definitely should click on it and follow, subscribe, do it, do whatever you need to do to uh, make sure you get the latest uh, from Kirk's podcast. It is um, a fascinating listen. Um, but in your recent episode, uh, The Politics of Protest, you explore some of those ripple effects of the student mm-hmm. protests. And um, one of the things you noted was larger numbers of both Muslim and Jewish students expressing uh, feelings of being unsafe um, on college campuses. And um, we thought that was fascinating because our, um, and our, albeit very unscientific, uh, assessment of the situation, we felt like there was a, you know, a very clear sort of trend of a lot of the things that were very definitely threatening the, the safety of, of students. So the doxing, the um, vigilante violence, the violence from the police or campus security, seemed to really be targeted at the folks who were, um, you know, in the kind of anti-genocide um, protest side of the equation. Um, and so with that in mind, we are wondering, A, did your research or your reporting confirm that, you know, that um, kind of assessment that we came to? And also, um, it seems that the the new anti-protest policies that many universities across the country are putting into place are also really targeted at the kind of anti-genocide um, protesters um, and sort of that side of the debate um, primarily, even though those folks were, you know, at least by our assessment, primarily the victims of the violence um, in last mm-hmm. year's protest. Um, what do you, assuming you think the facts agree with that, uh, what do you think accounts for the kind of direction of these anti-protest policies and what we're, what we're seeing um, now take shape at, at colleges and universities? Yeah, I mean, we, we were saying before that students are afraid of each other. I think in this case, schools are afraid of a repeat of what happened on a lot of college campuses last spring. So we're seeing kind of the tightening of you know free speech and demonstration policies. They're putting new restrictions on time and place of these protests. Some schools are banning things like chalking and masking. I know there in California, there's all kinds of restrictions. Um, there's even a threat to withhold funding unless they come up with a new, um, a new free speech policy at the Cal State system. Um, and I agree with you. You, you know, the, the doxing and the um, and the vigilante violence definitely tended to affect the pro Palestinian students. But we spoke with um, you know researchers at the University of Chicago, and they found that you know Muslim pro Palestinian students and Jewish students you know, and pro-Israel students um, were, you know, equally kind of af- afraid in this moment, right? And you have Jewish students hearing things like, you know, these chants, like from the river to the sea or global antifada and and being really afraid, right? And that that's real. You can't really deny that either. Definitely the doxing, no question here in Harvard, you know, there was this famous doxing truck that circled the perimeter of campus um, and identified pro-Palestinian students as quote unquote, Harvard's leading anti-Semites. And I, we know in that episode, we feature one of the students who was who was doxxed that way and just kind of how that threatened her sense of of safety, right, on campus. And it, I think she says at one point, she said, it would forever change how I experienced my time here at Harvard. Um, but going back to what, what schools are trying to do, um, you know, the, the biggest idea gaining traction now, I think, is this idea of promoting productive dialogue in and out of the classroom. So... You know, here in Boston, you have schools like Emerson, where over 100 pro-Palestinian activists and students were swept up and arrested back in April. Administrators have this new program. They're calling it Emerson Together. And the goal is to foster what they describe as unity on campus. Um, Out in Worcester, here in Massachusetts, Clark University is holding workshops on the history of anti-Semitism. Ohio Wesleyan is one of these schools now in the Midwest that's that's. um, offering civil discourse training to all students, faculty, and staff. And I think that this, you know, when I hear that, I think, wow, it's come to this, that they have to, you know, offer civil discourse training. You think that this would just be something that students learn at the K-12 to level. But the experts I'm talking to say we can't assume where students, faculty, and administrators are in this moment. And um, again, it kind of, all of this work comes at a time where our college campuses have become you know, battlefields in the culture wars. Um, and you have critics, mostly Republicans and conservatives, who say that, you know, they're concerned professors and administrators are polit- are pushing political agendas. Um, but higher ed leaders, I think, 
you know, they might disagree with that assessment, but they appear to be listening at the same time, right? That that they can disagree with that assessment, but that assessment is coloring the perception of their institutions, right? This idea that you guys mentioned, you know, that they're, that it's just, you know, everyone's just woke or they're, it's social indoctrination. Um, and I think there's a realization now when they're looking at some of the polling on, you know, the distrust in their institutions that, um, you know, if colleges don't listen to these critics, that they'll almost be complicit in their demise. And there's even more at stake, right? This idea that, you know, democracy fails when people lose trust in these institutions because they're training our future leaders. Um, So the professors that I'm talking to, though, you know, say it's one thing to have offer civil discourse training, but it's really tough to get students to talk um, across their differences in this moment. And there's all kinds of you know, initiatives to try to get them to talk, but it's, it's really hard work. Hmm. Yeah. And actually, I mean, speaking of this, this notion of these claims and allegations of there being these political agendas at the universities, I mean, in uh, one, one topic that comes up in your series is of course, this idea of indoctrination. And Mm -hmm. I, for one, really enjoyed the audio from that. I think it was in North Carolina, that diner. And uh, first of all, it sounded like the food there is delicious because uh, <laughs> I had the it's country just... <laughs> ham. I had the country ham. Part of the job. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just got a sense that that's that's some some good food up in there. But um, you know, you hungry mentioned people. The, the hungry people in North Carolina. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you you mentioned the Fox News on the t- uh, TVs in that in that particular diner, and we heard from folks in the diner, and and uh, we heard about this idea of these colleges being uh, liberal, uh, where liberal indoctrination is happening, and there's there was one speaker who said he went to I think it was UNC back in the early seventies, yeah. and they were you know socialists back then, and I could say it because I went there, right, and. As a teacher in California and as a teacher of ethnic studies, you know, I, I'm used to hearing these allegations that that there's all this indoctrination going on in our schools and all this indoctrination in our universities. Um, but then, you know, in thinking about higher education and its role in fostering a healthy democracy for tomorrow um, and thinking about what students are are sort of expected to be uh, to, to explore and to be taught and to grapple with, you know, it seems like there is a, there should be at least a sort of universal morality, a, a kind of a common agreement that we have just as Americans that like things like apartheid are wrong, things like harming people based on their religion or sex or race, like these things are wrong and these things are unacceptable in a, um, a diverse democracy like what we have. So we're wondering, you know, as you've explored the issue, where, where would you say that that line is between upholding what we consider to be basic humanitarian universal morality type values and, you know, creeping into this so-called indoctrination type space? Like where, where is that line as far as you see it in having spoken to all the folks that you've spoken to? Yeah, I think spending time in North Carolina, we, we went to North Carolina because that's the latest state to repeal diversity, equity, inclusion uh, programs. Right. Um, and they're adopting instead, it's almost like a, it's like a, um, you know, repeal and replace situation, they're replacing it with what they call institutional neutrality, basically saying institutions should not weigh in on these issues of the day. Um, But to answer your question, I mean, wherever the line is, um, I think, again, I think it depends kind of where you stand in the political spectrum. But because of that, the line is blurring. Um, And if you just take October 7th, which kind of lead to which kind of led to this um, uptick in schools picking up institutional neutrality and saying, you know what, we're not going to weigh in on on every single hot button issue of the day, whether it's, you know, systemic racism, abortion, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, the murder of George Floyd, right? Um, When you look at October 7th, it's a really interesting case study because that moment and the attack kind of caught everybody by surprise, but it really caught, definitely caught colleges by surprise. And a year ago, reflecting on the past year, I don't think any of us could have predicted that the attack would have led to these these protests and then the congressional hearings, you know, that featured Ivy League presidents, you know, uh, that, you know, it ultimately led to their resignations. This event and the subsequent protests over the war in Gaza kind of further divided these campuses. But if you zoom in, it really divided the progressive culture on these campuses, where for the most part, there had been consensus. Um, but but the event kind of split split the 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 progressive culture and then provoked this political backlash that we're still seeing now on and off campus. 
And so now we see more and more schools, including Harvard, you know, um, say, you know what, they're not, they're going to adopt institutional neutrality. Because if you take the, if you look at Claudine Gay and what happened before her resignation, I mean, it was complicated. She was facing, you know, plagiarism allegations and a number of other things. But that moment after October 7th, you know, she issued a statement, but only after former President Larry Summers kind of called her out and said that she wasn't saying enough. And then she rewrote the statement and then she issued another statement. I think in the end, she issued something like six or seven statements, right, on this. So this question of whether the institutions themselves should weigh in on these moral issues and these questions is really interesting. I don't think anyone's saying that, you know, professors and students shouldn't debate them, but there's definitely a trend now where schools are saying they're going to remain neutral on these issues and, and stop weighing in. And even progressive professors I talked to who say they never would have supported this um, are saying, you know what, in this climate, maybe we shouldn't weigh in on this. Um, you know, the George Floyd was a really interesting moment because here in Boston, everyone issued a statement, you know, after, after the murder of George Floyd, right? Everyone issued a statement to the point where it almost weakened it almost watered each one down, right? As they all kind of say the same thing. And they're almost boilerplate um, statements and they're all on social media and they're memes, you know, with the words written out, but, but no one's actually doing interviews. And the, the one interview, the one statement that I remember from that moment was actually Lee Pelton. who was the president of Emerson college at the time. He's now the head of the Boston foundation. Um, and rather than issue a statement, he wrote an essay. It was a personal essay about being racially pr profiled as a black man in the suburbs of Boston. And I'll never forget that. You know what I mean? All the statements I forget, right? And I think that's the trend that we're seeing now is schools want to be the, they want to be the forum for these debates and they want to, they want to talk about these issues. But I think they're, they're coming to the realization that maybe they shouldn't weigh in on every single issue and take a stance on issues. And yeah, of course, you know, of course they're anti-apartheid. Of course, um, you know, they oppose discrimination. But do they need to say it every single time in a, in a written institutional statement? That's that's the debate that's going on on a lot of college campuses right now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that certainly resonates. I think we, you know, to perhaps a lesser extent being, uh, you know, less sort of nationally public institutions the way many universities are. Right. Uh, they're, they're, you know, there's a similar phenomenon in K-12, right? Like what goes in the letter home, you know, to the parents or what gets, you know, spoken about at coffee with the principal meetings or, you know, even but with school board members at a, you know, a bit of a wider lens, but still a more, you know, local perspective. Um, you know, what's, what's the, where is the line between, right. you know, speaking about what's important, you know, that we, that we be clear about morally and also, you know, recognizing that, as you say, the, you know, the boilerplate nature of some of those statements actually can be counterproductive, you know? Right. The, the um, question I, I often hear is, you know, does, does Harvard need a foreign policy? You look at its endowment, you know, which is, you know, rivals the, uh, the Vatican, um, and you think, yeah, maybe maybe Harvard does need to weigh in on these. But it, it led to if you look at Claudine Gay and what happened after she issued that first statement and kind of how things how things progressed after that. I think even progressive professors who opposed institutional neutrality are now saying, you know what, in the end, it wasn't it wasn't worth weighing in. Yeah. From the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, very, very much appreciate your thoughts on all of that, Kirk. We have a, another juicy issue we want to get your take on here. Uh, <laughs> these, but, are light, but, these, are, these are light questions, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's Where's easy, the softball? I was promised easy. a softball question. <laughs> uh, You're saving that for the end. We're saving it for the end. All right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, a topic that you have taken on on the show, uh, there's an episode called The Borrower's Lament, another great, uh, great listen, and one that's very Thanks. close to my heart as a person who uh, paid off his student loans. I call Congratulations. it Congratulations. Thank you. I, I, I call it my first mortgage, uh, which I'm, you know, bitter about. But. Um, in this episode, you take on the issue of student debt and the, I, I might argue, the kind of surprisingly controversial nature of the conversation around student debt forgiveness. Um, so curious to hear your thoughts on what are some of the best arguments um, 
for and against large-scale student debt relief um, that, that you heard. And what do you think students who are considering college today should be considering as they um, are you know, considering taking on potentially large debt in order to fund their, their college experience? Yeah, so this, this was a fun episode to produce. I hope people check it out again. It's called Borrower's Lament. And it's really kind of tracking the roller coaster ride of the last couple of decades when it comes to student loan debt relief. Um, and there's been, you know, promises of loan forgiveness and then there's lawsuits, you know, more, more promises of loan relief, more lawsuits, the Supreme Court weighing in, states blocking these things. It's, it's really gut wrenching to follow, right? Especially if it's your life at stake and your, your money, right? But the idea of forgiving even a part of those loans is a political minefield, you know, here in Massachusetts and in California, maybe it's not right. Most people you go up to on the street and say, should we, you know, ease the burden on on students and loans? Everyone would say yes. But you go to places like North Carolina um, and it's a political minefield. People basically what it boils down to is people who didn't borrow to go to college or already paid back their loans or maybe they didn't go to college at all. Right. They don't get why they should have to pay a dime for those of us who did borrow money, but haven't repaid it yet, right? That's what it boils down to. And there's this kind of class divide that you find. Like in one of the episodes, we feature um, a waitress at that diner in North Carolina, right? And she says, she's like, why why should I be paying for someone's degree if the degree, if they can't earn enough to pay back what it costs them to earn that degree, right? That's a class divide that's really easy for politicians to exploit. And you have people like Virginia Fox, representative from North Carolina, who exploit it really well, or Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, right? You can see that side of the argument. Um, but you have, you know, you have 40 percent of the people in this country who borrow for college and they never even graduate. And that means that they have to repay their loans without the bump in earnings that they'd expect. Um, you got more than seven million people now in their 50s who are still paying off their student loans. Right. The average debt now for people when they get their bachelor's degree is twenty six thousand. But by the time they actually finish paying it off decades later now due to interest, it's forty three thousand dollars. Right. The system's broken. I think everyone agrees with that. Right. That's not that's not feasible because all of that debt means that people are putting off getting, you know, getting married, having kids, starting businesses, buying houses, all of these things that keep our economy going. And so it seems like a pretty pretty compelling argument, right, for forgiving loans, if that's going to help boost our economy at a time where we have inflation, people can't afford to to live. Um, but there is this surprising, I think it's surprising political divide. And we cite in that episode, a poll that was actually conducted by NPR, that found only a narrow majority of American of Americans think that student loan holders should have their loans forgiven. Um, and not surprisingly, it's those people like the, the waitress in North Carolina, who doesn't think that, um, you know, student loan debt, um, should be forgiven, that she should be, that any of her taxpayer dollars should be going towards that. So um, it's a compelling debate. Um, it, you mentioned your mortgage. You, we, sp we speak to a libertarian who uses that as an example, who says, you know, like, we don't see the government coming in to help people pay off their mortgage, right? If you decide to, to uh, get a house, it's your responsibility. And he says it should be the same for, for college degrees. But we speak to another expert who says, it's just gotten so out of control now with the cost of college. Um, and there is research that shows, you know, as the government has backed these loans, that that's driven up the cost of college, which has exacerbated the problem. But when it comes to tips, um, in terms of the best way to avoid student loan debt, it sounds obvious, but the, the, the best thing to do is to not borrow in the first place if you can, right? That's really hard to do. Um, but, you know, you can take there's certain basic steps that people should take. You know, it's crucial to really think about, you know, at the at the moment of enrollment, what college program are you signing up for? Right. And there's there is data out there. You can look at the college scorecard that comes from the federal government and you can look at things, you know, not just the school where you're going to enroll, but look at the major that you're thinking about majoring in. And then look, there's numbers that show what do graduates with those majors earn and will it be enough to pay off your debt? Unfortunately, in many cases, it's not, right? And that's why I think we're seeing more and more students go into things like, you know, STEM and computer science, and their people are fleeing 
the humanities and liberal arts, which as a history major and, you know, Italian minor, I think is a shame, right? A lot is lost when we have fewer people studying the humanities, right? Those skills that employers say they want, a lot of them come from studying the humanities, right? But people are realizing that with those degrees, you might not necessarily earn enough to pay off um, what you earn. But in terms of no- other ways to kind of avoid debt, you know, start in high school, you know, to your students, Manuel, you know, take advanced yeah. placement courses if you can. I know you're in early college, right? Yeah. It's an early college program. Those programs are key, right? Dual enrollment, early college, knock off as many courses as you can and credits in high school so you can avoid having to pay for them later. We have an episode in, I think, the second season called the or first season called the transfer trap about how unfortunately a lot of these these credits don't necessarily transfer because schools want you to take their courses and they want you to pay for their courses so make sure that when you're taking these courses make sure that you'll get credit for them too and that they'll be acknowledged um the other piece of advice i always give students is you know fill out the dreaded fafsa form right avoid all the negative press i mean it's been a fiat there's no question you know there's been a it's been a fiasco but the the payoff of just getting the highest possible amount of aid from the federal government without needing to borrow, that's key. Um, and that, of course, the, the the federal form dictates how much financial aid you're going to get. So, you know, find a university or college with the lowest price um, and that offers the best deal. Research the major um, that you're thinking about studying, because that often matters more than where you go. There's a, there's a famous Gallup poll that came out, I think it's probably about 10 years old now, but basically it found... It's not where you go, but how you go to college. And when you survey alumni about whether they think college was, quote unquote, worth it, um, they share a few things in common. There's a, there's a Venn diagram. Um, and it's basically you worked on a project for more than a semester and you had at least one professor, just one, who you think cared about you. And if you have those two things in common, um, then you think it was it was, quote, worth it. So research those things. And, you know, you, you can save a lot of money this way and you can avoid more, you know, taking on more debt. The other thing I always tell people is, is it's not like buying a car necessarily, but negotiate for more financial aid, you know, going into it. It's a buyer's market. And again, we not to plug the podcast, but we have another episode called Buyer's Market. And it's all about this. Colleges, they they want you. They're desperate. A lot of colleges are desperate for students, right? It's only the the super elite, highly selective schools that have the minuscule admissions rates. Most schools want you. Um, so go back to the college and ask for more help if you if you need it um, and uh, and get, you know, get the best deal and the most financial aid that you can get, because um, it's a really expensive investment, unfortunately. Um, but it's it's so crucial. And one thing we say again and again in the podcast is, you know, not everybody needs to go to college, but a lot more people do need to go. <laughs> right. That's the you know, the. That's 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 one of the key messages that we say again and again. So figuring this out and paying for it um, is such a big obstacle for families, specifically low and middle income families. So asking these questions at the point of enrollment is key. Yeah, yeah, ab- ab- absolutely, absolutely. And um, it's time for a softball. It's time for a <laughs> yes, softball. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so your podcast has the the really brilliant tagline pulling back the Ivy to reveal how colleges really work. (laughs) So we want to know from all these topics you've explored, all these folks you've spoken to, all this research you've done, what do you consider to be one of the most interesting things about higher education these days that, that a lot of folks aren't aware of? Can I say three things? Sure thing. (laughs) All right. Three (laughs) things. Because we've had, we've had three seasons. So I'm going to promote each season. The first season was all about the business of college admissions. And I think one of the key takeaways from that episode from the, that that series of episodes was, um, you know, again, kind of dispelling this notion that it's hard to get into college, right? It's hard to get into some colleges, but for the most part, you know, colleges want you. Um, and it's not as hard as people, families think it is to get into college these days. Um, and uh, and there's also this, this thing that I always try to remind our, you know, quote unquote, NPR audience that is tends to be highly educated. Um, not everyone goes to four-year highly selective public and private colleges. In fact, the minority of college students in this country, only 15% go to a four-year residential college. Most people go to community colleges and state universities. And the faster we all wake up to that and realize that that's where the majority of people are going, 
um, and struggling, you know, to reality, like they're struggling in those at those institutions, um, then then the worse off the, the country will be. Um, our second season is all about the, the business of paying for college. And one of the key things that I learned in that season was we did a deep dive on discount rates because everyone sees the sticker prices, right? Seventy, eighty thousand dollars. I think Vanderbilt is like one hundred thousand dollars in the sticker price. Right now, right? You're shaking your head, Jeffrey. Yeah. I know it's crazy, right? <laughs> but the real, but the reality is like, yeah. no one can afford that. Very few people pay a hundred thousand dollars. The average discount rate at four year schools in this country now is fifty six percent. And in that episode, we, John and I, my co host John Marcus and I, go to a record store here in Somerville, Massachusetts, and we start haggling the the owner. We ask him what is what his uh, most expensive record is. Um, and it's a $200 Grateful Dead box set. And uh, John turns to him and says, great, can I get it for 60% off? And the guy's like, no. And we say, why not? He's like, because I'd go out of business, right? In any other industry, these schools would go out of business if you're discounting that much, right? And at four-year private colleges here in New England, the discount rate for first-year students is 70%. They're discounting 70% of what they're charging just to get people in the door. And I do not think the average consumer of college knows that. And there's a term for it in um, in Tennessee. There's a can we talk about alcohol on this podcast? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought you were shaking your head. So there's a there's a whiskey called Chivas Regal in Tennessee. And the owner a number of years ago realized it was this like low end whiskey. And he realized no one was buying it because it was on the bottom shelf. And so he started marking up the price and the the liquor store owners started putting it on the second and third and fourth shelf and more people started buying it. And that's what they say in, in higher ed. It's called the Chivas Regal effect. No one wants to blink. Everyone wants to signal that their degree is worth 60,000, 70, 80, 90, 100,000 if you're Vanderbilt. Um, and so they're signaling, they're, they're kind of, they're kind of signaling the value of their, of their degrees by keeping the sticker price high, but discounting heavily. So that's kind of the lesson, key takeaway from the, the second season, I think. And in our third season, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, it's, you know, this idea of silence is safer. I think that is eye-opening. I'd heard that anecdotally from friends who are professors. You know, when I talked to them, I'm like, what's the biggest difference from when, when we were in school and they say, oh, no one talks anymore. Those freewheeling debates that we used to have, everyone's afraid of someone capturing it on Snapchat and, you know, shaming people. Um, but I think that's one of the key takeaways from our reporting in this third season about the politics of higher ed, where we are now talking about a generation of students who went through puberty on social media. They went through uh, the pandemic here on Zoom, right? As great as it is to talk to you guys in this two-dimensional way, it's not quite like an in-person conversation, right? Um, and now they're landing on these college campuses and some of them might, might not have ever made eye contact with someone with whom they disagree. Right. Whether you're conservative, progressive, moderate, doesn't matter. And during this election year, this presidential election year, um, you have these same students who are part of this broader toxic political environment we all find ourselves in, in which Americans are being encouraged by their leaders to kind of be suspicious of each other. That's a toxic, that's a toxic stew and does not bode well for um, civic engagement. And so I think that's one of the key takeaways um, from the third season is that we need we need students to feel comfortable on campus to to express themselves and feel like they belong. But at the same time, choosing a college just because you're comfortable there may not be the best thing either. Right. You want to be there is some there is some, as you know, in a good manual in a good classroom discussion, students might feel a little uncomfortable about things that are being said. Right. That, that's where the magic can happen sometimes in, in teaching and learning. And unfortunately, we're seeing less of that, I think. Yeah. Well, Kirk, uh, we are very grateful for your time today and for lending your uh, experience and expertise to these really important conversations about what's happening in our education system, specifically in higher ed, um, and maybe lending some insight and balance to a conversation that may or may not be reported uh, with, with that type of nuance if you're just flipping through the, the cable news station. So really appreciate your thoughts today, Kirk. Um, if uh, our audience would like to find you, follow you, learn more about you and the show, where, uh, where, should, they, where should they seek you out online? Yes, so College Uncovered is our podcast. You can find it 
uh, wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, and I am on, uh, I'm still on X or Twitter, whatever it's called, at Kirk Carapeza. Um, and you can find our stuff, um, you know, our, our stories air. In addition to the podcast, we do feature stories that air on your NPR member station. So support your local member station. I was going to plug that. And, yeah. um, and, you know, we work with NPR and Marketplace and The World, which is an international show. So um, we're really trying to bring, you know, these these kind of important stories about education um, to to a, a national and audience because it is it's so important. And, and education often gets, you know, short shrift in, in the national debate. But you guys are doing great work. I love this podcast. I love the name. I know you like my tagline, pulling back the Ivy, but I, I, I'm jealous of all of the above. <laughs> um, it's a great name and it's so important. I'm so glad you guys are talking about these issues because it's so important and it has implications beyond the classroom walls and these, these college campuses. Well, thanks so much, Kirk. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you with us today, folks. Kirk Carapeza is um, managing editor and correspondent for GBH News, also co-host of College Uncovered. Uh, we will have links to uh, for you to find the podcast, follow and subscribe below. Um, and that is it for today's seminar, folks. Thanks so much for joining us. Stick around. Next up is our class dismissed. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the episode where we like to give shout outs and appreciation to folks doing great work out there in the world of education. We call this class dismissed. And shout out to anybody who's still watching or listening all the way at the end of this episode. We very much appreciate y'all. But um, we do want to give a just heartfelt just salute and appreciation and love to everybody out there, every educator out there. We are over a year into this genocide in Gaza and in Palestine. And there are many educators out there continuing to do the great work of helping students engage with this very, very uh, troubling topic. There are many educators out there continuing to lead workshops and development and, and, and provide curriculum for teachers looking to, um, to, uh, to support educators and doing this good work in the classroom. You know, shout out to previous guests that we had, uh, Dr. Sosan Jaber, still winning awards and going to conferences and doing all kinds of dope stuff, sharing uh, her Palestinian experience and as an educator, ways for uh, teachers to, to engage their students in a humanizing way and uplifting and joyful way. So shout out to everybody out there still fighting the good fight. Uh, a year in so you know we see you i i, I saw a, a local school librarian who who keeps a, a little uh, display at the checkout counter that has a a running toll of of how many folks have been lost to this genocide to to not let folks just forget and just like lose any kind of uh, a sense of attention and awareness to what is continuing to happen so shout out to that school librarian and everybody else out there doing their part we see you we salute you and uh we love y'all yeah yeah, man. Well, I, you know, to me, what was very um, impactful uh, in recently here was, you know, with the passage of October 7th, the, the stunning silence uh, that I experienced in our, you know, field of education writ large um, with educators afraid uh, to speak or being unequipped with, you know, resources because of uh, you know, fear or because of those resources being stripped, you know, from the library shelves or the, you know, or the school shelves. But the stunning silence in the face of an ongoing genocide, one year plus now of that genocide, and the absolute and um, overwhelming complicity uh, of the United States in the perpetration of that genocide. And the connections we've talked about before on this show, Manuel, between, you know, schools in this country after Norm Day having to cut a teaching position because there's, you know, they're two kids short and they're losing funding from their budget at the same time as we continue to, to pour billions and billions of dollars into this very clearly, you know, racist and, uh, you know, oppressive genocidal military, um, you know, campaign uh, in Palestine. And now... You know, that expanding into, you know, surrounding countries as well. Um, and so, you know, being able to balance that with the humanity and the, you know, the value of all life and the recognition of what happened on October 7th as, you know, as, as being, uh, you know, a tragedy and also properly situating it within a historical context that, that knows that history did not begin 
on October 7th and that the life of Palestinians has just as much value as the life of anyone else um, in this world uh, and that we should be behaving accordingly. Um, so just want to give a shout out to the educators out there who are walking that very, you know, sort of treacherous tightrope and trying to figure out how to be ethical and, um, you know, humane in our practice um, as educators and to do so in the face of a stunning, uh, you know, deafening silence uh, that we experience on the issue of our complicity uh, in this genocide uh, here in this country. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, folks, that about does it for this episode of All of the Above. Remember, if you are watching us on YouTube, we come at you in between these full episodes with passing periods, but only as a podcast, only on your favorite podcast streaming apps. So find us over there. Uh, links below this episode for all of that. Um, we want to wish everybody a fantastic week at school or wherever you happen to be. Remember, we love y'all. You go to our, our website, aotashow.com, and see all the previous episodes and, and ways to support and all that stuff. But please don't forget writing reviewing thumbs up five stars all that good stuff it helps out a lot because we are just a two-person operation here at all of the above all right so that about does it for today's episode we'll see y'all next time